Faith Journey Church. Journey, it is an honor to be with you today, and I feel just at home, man. I tell you, you guys have made me feel welcome from Mark. Greet me when I'm coming in the door here. You guys take the church seriously, and I love it. And uh, anybody excited that it's summer? School is officially done, right? I tell you, man, this is, uh, I, like, like James said, he and I have been friends for about six years. I got three kiddos, and they're at three different schools. I feel like we are on a mission every single morning, right? We got to get them everywhere. There's time. There's detonators going off, right? It's like, get up, Go, 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 you know, and Chewy's full name is Chewbacca, just to clarify, all right, uh, within that, and uh, we're a little bit of a Star Wars family, uh, but hey, before I get going, I know school ended for us this week, school ended for you, uh, can we just recognize anybody who is a teacher or a school administrator or a coach, can you stand up real quick? We wanted to say well done to you guys, man, yeah. boy, you guys are the ones kind of parenting our kids, right? You spend more time with them and we say thank you. And for every negative email you get, today is your positive email, all right? We want to say God sees you, he has gifted you, and no matter what anybody says, the Spirit is doing a good work in you uh, today. Hey, with summer though, I love the transition uh, of the season. Matter of fact, today uh, I'm going to fly down and meet my family in Orlando. They'll go from Indiana, I'll meet them there, and we'll have our summer vacation because for us, school starts July 25th. I know, pray for us, right, you know, and, uh, and, and we go to this like balanced school schedule system, all this other stuff, so when summer hits, we actually kind of speed up because it's like we have no time to waste, and the time that, you know, everything kind of slows down with summer, we're like, no, go, we got to rest, we got to go there, right, and what I'm finding out is this, we're going to go to Florida, and here's what I found out, is if you take your kids on a vacation, you did not take a vacation, you took a trip, we went on a trip, and so this week, we're not going on vacation, we're going on a trip, and, right? And some of you are like, oh, yeah, I love today's church, right? You know, and, and that's what happens. Now, now, show of hands, though, because there is something that, that is fun and unique that God does at the summertime. You know, no more alarms for, for kiddos, no more kind of morning, all right, we got to hit the grind and get everybody everywhere and everything's going on. There's just another rhythm, and what happens at summertime is this, whether you know it or not, you go to the places that refuel your heart. To show of hands, how many people you are refueled by the water? You're like, just get me to the outer banks and I meet the Lord Jesus Christ right there, right? And you go, well, what do you do there? Nothing. That's what I do there, right? I just go and I meet with Jesus, right? Now, now how many, for some of you are like, no, 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 I don't wanna sit on the beach. You know, you know, you've got like the Appalachian Trail or you got mountains around here. How many people you love to go explore? I see that hand in the back, that went up quick, right? You're like, get me on the trail, right? Put some headphones in, get me out in nature. For some of you in the deer stand in the fall, that is the holy of holies, right? You know, that, that is where you're at. Now, some of you, who you, where you're going, no, I just want to have everybody over to my house all the time. Like, that is your idea. And then you're going to get some eye dyes, right? Some of you are like, oh, no, you're going to call me out. But I'm this way. I'm like, the more the merrier. Who's that, right? You're like, you don't even have to go anywhere. Like, just everybody come over here. Now, how many people love it when everybody leaves town? And you're like, staycation, right? You're like, I don't even need to go anywhere. Just everybody get out of here, Right? And I tell you, there's something that happens in all of us. And actually, I love this. It's in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. It says this, that God has set eternity in the hearts of man. That God has set eternity in you. That in you, whether you're a believer here today or not, you long for the presence of God. You long for refreshment. You long, there's things in creation that God has made that when you see it, when you experience it, there's something that begins to physically and spiritually happen in your heart and your life. Today, what we're gonna talk about is this, how we can actually be intentional with our rest this summer. That, that God is saying, I've made you for this. I want you to experience this way. And God is inviting you and I this summer. And my prayer is this. You're going to hear from some incredible speakers. My, my, my prayer for all of summer is this. That you and I would begin to meet with Jesus in the way that he wants to meet us. See, that's what happens when you go to the beach. You think it's the beach refueling you. Actually, what you're finding is this. You're experiencing the presence of God. And when you go on those trails, what you're finding is this, you're finding and experiencing the fingerprints of God. 
And when people come over to your backyard, and even though they may beat you in cornhole, just to humble you a little bit, right? You begin to experience the blessings of relationships that God has brought in your life. There was a quote by a pastor, I love him, his name's Mark Batterson, he pastors down in Washington, D.C., never met him or anything, but man, when he said this quote, it resonated with my heart and my soul, specifically around summertime. And this is what he said. He said, a change of pace plus a change of place equals a change of perspective. Man, when something happens in summertime when you and I slow down, when there's a different pace that begins to come into our life. And not only do we change the pace, we change the place. We're going to Disney for one day because that's all I can afford, right? And uh, like my, my buddy asked me this. He said, you're going to Disney? And I said, yeah, you know, it's only going one day, you know, and all this stuff. He goes, Nate, you want to know how you're ready to go to Disney? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Like, you know, and uh, he goes, take a hundred dollar bill out, light it on fire. <laughs> and if it does not bother you, you are ready for Disney, right? Like, like, like that is how you and I, right? Get, you know, that, and I'm like, okay. but, but there's something that happens, right? When there's a change of pace in our life and there's a change of place, we begin to have a change of perspective. I don't know if you've ever been there where something's been, like it has been weighing on your heart, it's been consuming your mind and you kind of get out of your routine and you kind of get out of the daily grind and you look back and you say this, man, that actually wasn't that big of a deal as I thought. And what happened is you kind of got out of the normal rhythms and the things began to change. Well, how do we live in that? How do we live in this different perspective? If you've got your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew 11, uh, or if you got it on your YouVersion Bible app, or it'll be up here on the screen. But I want to invite you to Matthew 11, because what's amazing is this. Jesus drops this dime of a passage. We're just going to look primarily at about three, pass uh, three verses today. There's going to be some other verses that we'll add on. But what's amazing is this, Jesus in Matthew 11, there he gets approached by John the Baptist's disciples because John started Jesus's ministry. The only thing is this, he's now in jail. Anybody ever follow Jesus and you got punished by it? Like you begin to invite maybe somebody to church, to journey church at your work, and now you don't get invited to lunch with those people. You're like, thanks a lot, James, for telling me to invite my friends to church. Right now, I don't have any, right? And there's these times that, that we experience suffering for following Jesus. And John the Baptist in, in Matthew 11 sends his disciples to Jesus, and he says this, are you really the Savior? Because I'm suffering. My soul doesn't have rest right now, Jesus. And so are you really the rest Later on in Matthew 11, what's amazing is this, Jesus gives a warning to the towns that he did miracles in because here's what happened. They had miracles, but they never turned their life over to him. And Jesus warns them and he warns us today is this, if you're looking for rest and stuff, your stuff will break down, let you down, but Jesus will never let you down. And he's saying, hey, listen, heads up, the stuff that you're pursuing, if it's not me, actually won't bring you rest. And then in Matthew 12, what's amazing is this. It says Jesus is, and his disciples are walking through the grain fields and they start picking some wheats of grain and eating. The only thing is it's on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees say, oh, they're not really followers of God because if they were, they wouldn't break the Sabbath, which was a day of rest. So how in this world in a restless, tired, overworked, overwhelmed, high anxiety world, do you and I find rest? How do we do it? Jesus just drops this little dime between Matthew 11 and Matthew 12. I want to turn our attention to it. Listen to what he says. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find what? Rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says this, if you're looking for rest, even if you're a follower of Jesus and you go, my soul feels restless today, this is what he's telling you and I, that rest is found in the presence of Jesus. 
Oftentimes, this is what we're looking for. We're like, once I get to the beach, and then your transmission falls out on the way to the beach, and you're like, we should have never gone here in the first place. I knew it, right? And there's things that begin to come up and pop up. Now, now here's the thing, and there's nothing wrong with this phrase overall. The only problem is sometimes it doesn't express the fullness. We say stuff like this. We need to put Jesus first. And I'm not against the idea of putting Jesus first. But here's what I've learned. I don't just need to put Jesus first. Here's what I've learned. I need to put Jesus in the center. I need to put Jesus in the center of my parenting. I'm going to be back on Father's Day. And can I just give you a sneak preview? As parents, we have no idea what we're doing. We just can't tell our kids that, right? You know what I'm saying? Like that's it. It's like, congratulations, you're a parent. I take them home? Like, like, can I just come back and visit them at the hospital? Right? Nope, yeah, you're right. And now here's, what, here's the deal. As a parenting, here's how you and I find rest and what we need in parenting. We put Jesus at the center of our parenting. How do we know we're in the right career? You put Jesus at the center of your career. I love it, not to brag on too much, but uh, I got to stay with uh, Sean and, and Suzanne, or Susan, uh, and uh, man, this, this weekend, man, unbelievable leaders. Here's what I love about them. They're on their second career. Only the Lord can call you out of retirement into church work, right? <laughs> but I love it because here's what I'm experiencing. I've only met them for one day, but this is what I know about them. They're putting Jesus at the center of their work. Jesus in the middle of a restless situation says, you put me at the center, and it doesn't mean all the suffering's gonna go away, and it doesn't mean all the struggles are gonna go away, but what you're gonna find is this, you are gonna find rest for your souls. Rest, that's what he says. He goes, some people just want a nap, and man, naps are from the Lord. <laughs> if you wanna know the Lord loves you, take a nap, right? God, thank you. Put golf on in the background, right? You know what I'm saying? It just, it's to the seventh level of heaven we go, right? You know, it's, just, it's amazing. But here's what we all know. In life, we need more than a nap, don't we? We need rest for our souls. Hope for our souls. And Jesus, in this passage, what we find is this. He says, rest actually comes before work. Isn't that strange? He says, Come to me, all of you who are burdened and weary, and I will give you rest. Now, for us, we hear the song. Everybody's working for the what? Four of you have heard the song. All right, great. I thought that was going to be, maybe, maybe the 11 o'clock will pull me through here, right? right? No, no. Everybody's working for the weekend because the idea is you work and then you rest. And Jesus says that's not how rest works. You rest in me, and then you will know the work I have for you to do. That's how he starts the passage. Come to me, all of you who are burdened and weary. Your burden and weary, actually those words mean this. Come to me, all of you who are beat and overwhelmed, and I will give you rest. What he's saying is this. I don't need you to work your way out. I want you to allow me to work my way in. And when I work my way in, what you will find is this. You will find rest for yourself. Anybody grew up, I grew up with this phrase in the church, uh, hearing this all the time. Oh, yeah, so-and-so's going out work. We're going to have a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> oh, that sounds so great, right? Like who, <laughs> you know, I don't want to miss those. No, 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 right? Come to Jesus meeting. There is always negative and confrontational, and we're going to drop the hammer. It's not what Jesus said. You know what Jesus says? Come on. You overworked. You overwhelmed. You don't have the answers. Come on. Come on. I've got rest, and I have rest for your souls. See, rest comes before work. Some of you are like, Nate, I, I know Jesus said it, but prove it. Here's what's amazing, and it took me forever to learn this. And here, here's my problem. Here's my broken mentality that the Lord has had to grow me through. I still struggle with this. It's this. Uh, and, and nobody taught me this. There was no Bible verse that taught me this. This was just my, my natural kind of default mode. We all have a default mode. Uh, here's my default mode. Uh, if you work hard, everything will work out. And so if things aren't working out, guess what you do? You work harder. Some of y'all are like, elbowing your spouse right now and be like, hey, I think he's right. You know, no elbowing, right, right? That's, this has been my broken metaphor. 
If something's not going right in relationship, it's because I'm not trying hard enough and I got to fix it. Matter of fact, uh, my grandpa, uh, God bless him, he grew up in a town, 800 people in central Illinois, and he was an elder at his church. And uh, when, when you, you're in a small community, you do everything as an elder, right? And uh, not only that, he had a bobcat, and so one day he was paving the church parking lot, like spreading out the rock, you know, and they're kind of church of 50, 60 people. And uh, one of his neighbors drove by, and they saw him, he was slumped over in, uh, in the bobcat. And they thought he'd pass out or something, they came up, to him and they said, Eldon, Eldon, are you okay? And he said, and, and they could see his face was drooping. He was having a stroke in the bobcat while he's there working in the parking lot. And she said, uh, Eldon, you're having a stroke. And he goes, I know, but I'm almost done. Like that's my grandpa, right? Like that's the DNA where I come from. You said you were gonna pave the church parking lot. I don't care if you're having a stroke, you paved the church parking lot, right? Now, here's the thing about my grandpa. He was a kind, gentle soul. He wasn't mean. He didn't demand all this other stuff, but we all have these default modes. I love what Pete Scazzaro said. He said, Jesus may live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. <laughs> See, Jesus may save us, but that doesn't mean the way that we work in our life, we work the way that Jesus wants us to work. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 2, this is how the creation order works. I had a friend show me this because it, it really has been my struggle because the thing is I have no problem working. The only thing is this, sometimes I will default to my work and I won't let Jesus work first. I'll try to fix it instead of letting him in. Genesis chapter two, God goes through the creation order and on the sixth day he created who? Man. And on the seventh day, what did God do? So what was the first thing man experienced? Rest. Do you know you were created to experience rest in the presence of Jesus? That's what you and I were created for. See, your work, work's not a curse. Some of you are like, I begged a different Nate. I'd like to meet you with you in the connection room after service, right? Like, I, I'd, li I'd like to give you my story, right? Hey, I'm not, now, now here's the deal. Work is not a curse, but here's the thing. Our work has been cursed because of sin. Thorns and thistles. And then when it says you work by the sweat of your brow, it doesn't mean hard work. It means this. Every single time Adam and Eve before that moment planted something, guess what it did? It always returned what was planted. And now by the sweat of your brow, it's not that you're going to have to do hard labor. By the sweat of the brow means this. You may launch your business. You have a great business plan. You have a great thing. And then a little thing called COVID came up and shut it all down. And by the sweat of your brow, is this going to work out? Am I going to have a paycheck? And Jesus says, in that tension, I want you to experience my rest. See, rest is this different way. Rest comes before our work. It's you and I learning to rest in him. This is why over and over Jesus says, abide in me, abide in me. And the whole idea of the Sabbath that he talks about in Matthew 12, it's not just that there's about one day of rest because Jesus begins to say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am your rest. I am the one that will give you life. I am the one that will help you because here's what will happen. Too many times, here's the fight in the work of our life. It's to get affirmation. It's to get recognition. It's to get approval of people. And man, we're working hard and we're working harder than what, what actually we ever realized. And Jesus says, no, I've got a different way. I, I love this in Proverbs chapter 20, verse five. And some of you are like, man, I'm gonna have to do some deep soul searching. Listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse five. It's one of my favorite passages. It says, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. Today, you need to know, even if you're not a Christian, you're deep. You're already deep. And here's why. You ready? Because you're made in the image of God. It's not will you get your doctorate, and I'm not against education. Being deep doesn't mean you have a doctorate. Being deep is recognizing you are made as deep waters because you're made in the image of God. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. 
Here's what I love the most about your church. I was just getting to hear a little bit more stories. Uh, you guys have had over 50 baptisms this year so far. Can we just praise God what the Lord is doing, man? And I love hearing about life change, but here's what really got me excited when I heard that. Sean said this, he goes, and here's what's so cool. He said, every single one of those 50 people that were baptized got partnered with a mentor that's gonna walk with them through the next three months so they can experience life and have people who will draw out and help them experience the presence of God. And I'm like, now that is the church, right? The church is you and I stepping up to say, I don't have it all figured out. But God, would you bring people in my life to help journey with me, to help guide me, to help lead me, to help point me forward? See, this is the ways of rest. This is why Jesus says, come on, come on. I don't need you to have it all figured out. I, I love this. I, I don't know if it's in the Greek, but I could imagine, right? Because I don't even have my master's, right? But I can just say it, right? But here's the thing. In the Greek, this is what I think when he says, come to me. This is what I think he's saying. Just show up. You're like, well, I can do that. And Jesus is like, I know, that's all I need. Man, will you just show up? Journey Church, some of you have been a follower of Jesus for a long time, and actually, if, if you're a transparent, you're getting bored with church. And it's not, will you show up next Sunday? Here's the question. Will you begin to show up in the life of others around you? to help guide them, to help experience the rest because all of us are longing for it, but we're going, will somebody help me experience the rest that God has? See, rest, it's before work, but here's what the rest of Jesus is saying is, rest is about realignment. It's about realignment. This is why Jesus says right after he says, come to me, all of you who are burdened, weary, all of you who are overwhelmed, and I will give you rest. You will know that my cross, what he was going to do was the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy that you need. But then he says this, after, right after that, he says, now take up my yoke and learn from me. Now, I've never lived on a farm, so I had to Google what a yoke is, right? You know what I'm saying? And I may live in southern Indiana, but don't think everybody just lives on a farm, all right, in southern Indiana, right? And now here's the thing, a yoke, you would put it on an oxen, and here was why. They would put the two oxen together because when they would go together, they were always more powerful. And Jesus says, I want you to come to me, but here's the thing. I don't want you just to come to me. I want you to stay with me. Put my yoke on you. And then he says this, and learn from me. Literally, the word disciple, actually, let me, let me reverse it. The word Christian shows up three times in the New Testament, and the word disciple shows up 260 times. And you know what the word disciple means? Simply this, learner. Jesus says, I don't need you to have it figured out. I just need you to have a spirit that's willing to learn. Will you come after me? Will you put on my yoke? Will you put on my grace? Will you put on my kingdom values? Will you receive my Holy Spirit and will you learn from me? Will you walk with me? Will you grow into the things that I have for you? See, this is the beauty of Jesus, his rest. It doesn't just save us in that moment. It carries us through every moment of life. Jesus is always providing something new. The only thing is this, this really is our struggle as followers of Jesus. We'll come to him, but will we stay with him? Matter of fact, this is, uh, I'll summarize all of the Old Testament in one sentence. They just wouldn't follow and hang out with God. All right, you read the Old Testament today, right? You know, you're, some of you are like, man, you just saved me a lot of time. I'm reading Leviticus right now. I have no idea what's going on, right? But the premise was this. I'm your God, you're my people, I'll provide for you, you stay with me. And they just continue to not do it. This is why Jesus is the true Israelite, because he's the faithful Israelite that stayed with his heavenly father even when it got tough. One of my favorite passages, it's been so helpful for my soul as I've had to battle my own struggles with beginning with work instead of beginning with resting in Jesus. It's in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. And Isaiah is honest with the people of God. He's just communicating what he says. And he says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. Now, uh, what, what is it that we do in that? 
Repenting and resting is going, God, I've messed up. I will place my life in your hand. He's like, and that is your salvation. And quietness and trust is your strength. But Israel, you would have what? None of it. Repentance and rest is your salvation. Good works follows the grace of Jesus. I love the good works that you guys are doing. The food pantry that's here, the ministry, the outreach. We're talking about the mission trips that you guys do, all these incredible things that the Lord is doing. But can I just let you know, all of those things all begin with the grace of Jesus. And God has to tell his people, he goes, guys, repentance and rest is your salvation. And then he says this, in quietness and trust. Can I just give some of you the freedom today? You don't need to power up to follow Jesus. Actually, following Jesus is about you and I powering down. God, I don't have it. And can, can I just let you know, he never asked you to have it. He just asked you and I to be open to it. God, will I be open to your grace? God, will I be open to your ways? Had a pastor, John Thompson, out of Canada. Uh, he, he pastors in Toronto, and he and I just become good friends, just mutual uh, kind of ministry gatherings. Uh, and he had a book that came out called Convergence, and it was so helpful for me because what he did was he framed up the ways and the rhythms that Jesus kept rest in his life. I'm one of those people, I, I can't come up with great ideas, but if somebody can show it to me, then I can do it. How many people are that way? You're like, just show me what you want me to do. I tell Ruthie all the time, just write it out. I, I will do it. Just tell me what to do. I will do it, right? You know, and oftentimes in marriage, we're like, well, you should just know. Help me, Holy Spirit, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, help me to know, right? Give the words of wisdom to me, right? And, and, and you know, and, and these are just the things. And I remember sometimes it can be so hard to, to follow Jesus. He said, here's the three things that Jesus did. This was so helpful. He said, here are the three things that Jesus did. His three rhythms were, one, he lived by his spiritual disciplines, right? He lived by his spiritual gifts, and then he obeyed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. This summer, what if that is what your schedule was? Talked to Mark on the way in. Sorry, Mark, gonna call you out. And uh, we're just chatting, and I said, man, what a great guy to be right here to welcome everybody coming into this place. And uh, I said, boy, you're like, how many cups of coffee have you already had this morning, Mark? You know, you're pretty fired up there. He goes, well, I was up at 4 a.m. And I said, "Woo, right? You, you're more holier than me, my man. And, uh, and I said, what was your really? He's like, well, man, I, I just, I got to spend time with the Lord. And then I work out uh, and, then, and then I'm here and I'm using my gifts. And I went, he has no idea I'm about ready to say this. What would it look like this summer? You got all sorts of plans. Man, I'm not saying don't go to the beach. Go to the beach. Go to a place that refuel your heart. Have the people over to your house that brings you life, that, that brings you energy, right? Make that brisket to the glory of God, right? Let people taste and see that the Lord loves them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like yes, yes, and yes. But this summer, what would happen if you began to live by the rhythms of Jesus to experience the rest of Jesus? Jesus lived by his spiritual gifts, he lived in disciplines. This is why the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Because what they find him doing all the time, praying. In Mark chapter 1, we find him obeying the Spirit. And here's the thing. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus used his gifts of healing. He heals the entire village. It says everybody was bringing all their sick people. He heals, and then this is what happens. It says, then very early in the morning, he gets up to a quiet place to pray, a, a quiet solitude. And if you look through the book of Mark, here's what's fascinating. Jesus always gets by water. He's human. He's fully God, and he's fully human. He's like, get me some of them outer banks, right? Get me a view. He wants to be refreshed. And what does he do? He prays. And then the disciples show up, and listen to what the disciples say in Mark chapter 1. They go, Jesus, everybody is looking for you. There's more people. 
we're going to have to add another service. We're going to have to add a one o'clock service here at the Journey Church, right? Everybody's here, Jesus. We got to expand the church. We got to do this. And you know what Jesus said? He goes, well, if they're here, okay. Know what he says? He goes, nope. He goes, let's go to the other village to preach the gospel because that is why I have come. One of the toughest things you and I will experience as followers of Jesus is disappointing people. For some of you, you disappointed your parents when you became a follower of Jesus. But you knew there was an allegiance that needed to take place in your life. Some of you, you disappointed your spouse by coming to this church. But they're going to see the grace and mercy of Jesus because you're resting in the presence of him. Sometimes you're going to need to make tough decisions in life and you're, need, you're going to need to disappoint people. Not because it's fun. It's actually one of the most painful things. But here's the thing. There is nothing more essential in our life than obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are here today because you had a friend obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit and invited you to church. Some of you are serving, like Kyle said, and you know what? I, I, I love it because it's not just about the pastor up here on stage that's preaching. Peter says this, the church is the royal priesthood, a holy nation that all of us has, all of us have spiritual gifts. All of us need to be empowered. All of us need to be equipped. And I'm letting you know, you are doing more work when you begin to live out of your gifts than you could ever imagine. And God is going, come on. See, this is how Jesus lived. He's like, hey, here's the spiritual gifts that I have. I'm going to put them to work. I'm not going to ignore my spiritual disciplines, and I'm going to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, it's time to start a life group because God has been telling you to do it for the last 18 years. And you're like, this summer is the summer. Some of you are going, yeah, God's been whispering. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit, but it's time to obey. Jesus ends this passage by saying this. He begins to say this in verse 30. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because you will find rest for your souls. And then he says this. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Easy and light. Well, that sounds totally different than the world, doesn't it? My yoke is easy. And you know why his yoke is easy? Because the cross was heavy. My burden it's actually light. I'm not here to crush you. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to humiliate you. I'm here to redeem you. I'm here to call you into my kingdom. I'm here to invite you in to the calling that I have on your life. Journey Church, he's inviting you to bring his kingdom right here, right now. I'm inviting you this summer to experience the kingdom of God in your home and in your neighborhood and in your work and in your retirement and in the places you go. See, rest, and this is the last thing when he says that, he goes, when my yoke is easy and my burden is light, what he's saying is this, rest is about the active journey with Jesus. Some of you are like, good, because I thought all you were going to say is that we just need to sit still on our porch all summer. And some of you are like, please don't tell me that's what rest is. No, rest sometimes is slowing down, but rest is also actively journeying with Jesus, going with him with where he's called you to go. What you find throughout the rest of the Gospels is this. The whole story is a story of disciples going on a journey with Jesus I don't know if you're familiar with the, the life of the Apostle Peter, how his life ends, but he says this. He denies Jesus at the cross, right? The last night he denies him. But then something happens. He ends up dying for Jesus. 
And you go, how do you go from being a denier of Jesus to a dyer for Jesus? He made the presence of Jesus his greatest priority. Maybe an invitation for you this summer is to read the book of 1 Peter. Peter writes 1 Peter to the church 20 years later from his moment of denial. And what you find is this. You find a man who has gone on an active journey with Jesus and nothing is the same. Nothing's the same. Journey Church, what would happen for you this summer if the greatest goal was the presence of Jesus? You're like, yeah, yeah, we got vacation. Right when we got vacation, I got FCA camp. I've got church camp. I'm going to send them to a play camp. I don't know. We're just going to get them out of the house, right? We're gonna, you're going to go to that camp. You're going to do all this stuff, right? I know this. It's going to be wild. We're going to have all sorts of camps this summer with our kiddos, but I know this. This isn't just something for you. This is something for me. God, will your presence be the greatest goal this summer in our house? I want to invite you to do this with me if you're able. Would you just close your eyes and open your hands and maybe put them on your knees? Just open and extend it. For some of you, this is very natural. It's how you pray. It's how you worship. Some of you, is very different. It's a spiritual discipline of saying, God, we have all sorts of plans. We have all sorts of pain going on in our life. We have all sorts of problems, things that are are real. God, this summer, we want to offer them to you. And God, not just do we want to offer our life to you, but what we're saying when we do this is, God, We want your presence more than anything. And so just right now, think about what it is that is heavy, that you're carrying by yourself. And you simply need to bring to Jesus. Would you receive his presence right now in the middle of that? Father, I'm confident that this summer is going to be a transformational summer at Journey Church. Not because of all the plans that have been made. And Father, not just because the staff is incredible, because they are. But Father, because your spirit and your power wants to work in your church this summer. And so God, right now, we lay before you all of our plans, all of the places that we're gonna go. And Father, above all of that, God, we want you. Lord, would you draw our hearts and our minds to pay attention? God, would you give us courage to speak? God, would we take the steps that you've called us to take this summer? Lord, as a church family, would we speak encouragement? Would we carry burdens? Father, would we simply obey your presence this summer? God, thank you for not holding yourself back from us, but Jesus, you give us the fullness of God. And because of that, we can be set free. So Lord, may we move in your lightness today. And it's in your name that we pray. And everybody said together, amen.